Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Space Telescope public lecture series. Today, we have a really great talk about the interstellar medium, uh, where gas, dust, and stars meet. So I, I have a joke that I am obligated to tell about the interstellar medium. If an astronomer received a signal from a long dead civilization, does that make them an interstellar medium? Okay, bad joke. Anyways, uh, my name uh, is uh, Dr. Kelly Lipo. I am in fact not Dr. Frank Summers, who normally hosts these uh, these lectures, uh, but I'm here today because he is on a well-deserved vacation. Um, and I'm also joined tonight with my uh, tech team, Thomas Marufu and Grant Justice. Grant will be monitoring the YouTube chance chat. So if you have any questions uh, for our speaker or you want to discuss things among yourself, please put all of your questions in the chat. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping before we get started with tonight's talk. Uh, on October 3rd, 2023, we have a talk from uh, Nimishi uh, Karam Kumari. Oh my gosh. Sorry, I butchered that name. <laughs> Nimisha Kumari. There we go. From the Space Telescope Science Institute, who is going to tell us about web science. <laughs> Sorry about that, Nishi. She, oh my gosh. Oh, on November 7th, 2023, we have a talk from Tim Rue and Margaret Carruthers from the Space Telescope Science Institute, also about making astronomy outreach accessible to different types of audiences, including blind and visually impaired people. And then in December uh, of 2023, we have the infamous TVA, where Frank will find another speaker and let you all know about it shortly. So on the topic of knowing about upcoming events, if you would like to get notifications about upcoming events or see any of our past live streams, you can do that on our website at stsci.edu slash public dash lectures. Um, and there are links for webcasts, uh, recordings of past lectures, and also email uh, sign up uh, box, put your email in there and get notifications about upcoming events. Um, so how do you get in contact with us? As I said, you want to sign up for emails. I think they send like two emails a month. Um, you can sign up at the website, stsci.edu slash public hyphen lectures. You can subscribe to this here YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Hubble Space Telescope. And there you will get notices and reminders about live events just like this one. And also, if you have comments, uh, you can email public lecture at stsci.edu. Um, you can complain about how I just messed up those speakers' names. I feel so bad about that. Uh, you can tell Frank that you miss him and you wish that you were back, or you can say, you know what we need? We need more of Kelly on this YouTube channel, so let them know. Um, follow us on social media. Um, so we have lots of different social media accounts, uh, whatever flavor that you're interested in. Um, and so these are in order of the Hubble account, the web account, and the STSCI account. On Facebook, it's Hubble Telescope and Web Telescope and STSCI. On Twitter, it's at Hubble Telescope, at NASA Web, and at Space Telescope. On YouTube, it's Hubble Space Telescope and NASA Web Telescope. And on Instagram, it is space underscore telescopes and NASA Web. And if you are looking for someone else to follow, I am primarily on Mastodon, uh, which is sort of like Twitter or X, but more chill and just a wee bit more nerdy. Uh, you can follow me at Kelly Lipo at astrodon.social. And, um, that Frank also told me that I can do a news from the universe segment, and you should all be very proud of me that I am not doing just a uh, weird star news segment. I will actually tell you about some really interesting stories that have come up over the past month or so. So our first story tonight is about a new view of the Whirlpool galaxy. So this is a very old view of the Whirlpool galaxy. Uh, this is a image from the Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies compiled by Holton Arp in 1966. This is a photographic plate 
taken with one of the big telescopes uh, in California, maybe the Palomar Observatory. I don't know exactly which one, but this was the state of the art in 1966. Uh, let's see what the state of the art was in 2005. Here we have the Whirlpool Galaxy as seen by Hubble. And here we actually see two pairs of galaxies which are interacting with each other. We have the Whirlpool Galaxy, which is this beautiful grand design spiral in the center. And we also have a companion galaxy off to the side right at the end of one of its spiral arms. It's a lenticular galaxy. And these two galaxies are actually in the process of merging with one another. And that's probably why the Whirlpool has such beautiful, very clear spiral arms. Okay, so that's what it looks like with visible light with Hubble. Let's see what it looks like with Webb's infrared eyes. Ooh, look at that. Um, so Webb just in image this strip in the middle of the Whirlpool galaxy, and we can zoom into this a little bit. It looks like that. Uh, so here we have the dark red features uh, which trace the filamentary warm dust and the colors of red and orange and yellow show gas in the galaxy that was recently ionized by clusters of blue stars, which are those blue dots in the image. Uh, if we though move on uh, to the mid-infrared view, we get the really wild image from Webb here. Um, so this in mid-infrared light, what Webb is primarily seeing are filaments of dust and molecular, or molecular hydrogen and other molecules in the galaxy. So what do I mean by dust? And I think Alex might get into this a little bit. By dust, I mean teeny tiny particles of sand and things that kind of resemble soot. And so we are seeing here these cold, dusty clouds inside of the whirlpool. And we also see these filaments, which are these areas carved out by clusters of newly forming stars. I think someone on social media said that this looked like a biblically accurate angel. And I, you know, think that maybe they're onto something. It's both creepy and beautiful at the same time. Okay, moving on to our second story of the evening, cosmic question mark. Uh, so here is where I get to talk about weird star news, at least in the beginning. So here is a 2013 image uh, from the uh, new technology telescope from ESO's uh, La Silla Observatory in Chile. This is a ground-based optical telescope image of this cold, dark, dusty cloud. And inside of this cloud, we have a pair of newly born stars which are orbiting each other. You can't see them in this image, but what you can see is this jet that they're blowing out. Um, and they're actually blowing out a jet above and below their disk, but we're only seeing one of the jets in this image um, because the other jet is actually embedded inside of this dark, dusty cloud. Okay, let's switch over to Webb's infrared eyes. And here we are seeing through this nebula and we are seeing the full jet made by these pair, this pair of baby stars. And we can see the cavities that are being carved out inside of the jet, the walls of these cavities are glowing. The stars themselves are that bright red thing in the center. You can see the bright red diffraction spikes coming off of these stars. Uh, but wait, there's more. Some eagle-eyed Redditors spotted something while they were staring at this image. So, computer, enhance. We are going to zoom into this image. There we go. Okay, and let's try that again. What is that? So uh, the internet has dubbed this the cosmic question mark. And uh, going back to our first story of the evening, we don't quite know what this is, but we're pretty sure it is a pair or maybe even three uh, galaxies which are about to merge together. And as galaxies merge together, they tug on each other with gravity and they can make some pretty interesting arc-like shapes. And so that's what we, Think the cosmic question mark probably is. 
um, if we could see it in a little more detail, it might look like this. And so this is a Hubble visible and near infrared light um, image of another pair of merging galaxies. And you can see this kind of question mark like shape. Okay, that's enough uh, from me for tonight. I am not who you came to see. Uh, instead, we are going to hear uh, from, from Dr. Uh, Alexandra Hemanovich. Um, Dr. Alexandra Hemanovich is a postdoctoral researcher at the Space Telescope uh, Science Institute, where she studies gas in and around galaxies using the Hubble Space Telescope. She is originally from Poland, where she finished her undergraduate studies at the University of Warsaw. Afterwards, she continued her astronomical journey as a graduate student at the European Southern Observatory in Germany. Alexandra, privately an avid choral singer, lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and her rescue lab, Gidget. Uh, and we were in a call right before this, and we said, we can't tell everyone about your rescue dog, Gidget, without showing a photo. So here it is. Here is Gidget. Everyone say, aw. Okay, and without any further ado, I am going to hand things over to Alex. Take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, just making sure we everything is fine. Hello, Looks everybody. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining me for the, this journey through uh, the galaxy, where we're going to learn a little bit more about the area of the galaxy where gas, dust, and stars meet. Uh, I am. Uh, I had a wonderful introduction with uh, some of the aspects I'm going to talk a little bit about. So you saw beautiful filaments of dust in other galaxies. Uh, we saw all of these wonders with James Webb are showing, and I will hope that I can give you a little bit of the insight about what we are actually seeing and how astronomers are studying this elusive interstellar medium. But if you were lucky to view the night sky somewhere very, very dark, where you actually, apart from the uh, thousands of stars, could also see the trail of the Milky Way, you would immediately see the difference between the strain of the Milky Way and all of the rest of the night sky, as it shows as this cloudy, very extended uh, structure uh, on the sky. And even more than with our naked eyes, when we look at the um, longer exposure photographs or videos like this one, we can definitely see uh, some sort of a structure, some uh, another cloudy-like uh, structure and some darker areas. And what we are actually seeing is we are looking throughout the disk of our galaxy all the way to its center, and we are looking through the interstellar medium. Because when we will be thinking about galaxies and about stars, we could think that this is this gigantic space filled with nothing and those singular stars so far away from each other. We just often uh, hear that travel uh, between the stars will take so many, many years and even generations and so that makes you think that there is nothing in between there in this vast empty space. But that's not entirely true as this whole of the space is filled with gas and dust. But let's not be confused with how the, the, it appears on this image, like the serious like clouds. In fact, this is still very high vacuum. And uh, even this gas and dust in the interstellar medium, it's, much, uh, it's not as dense as air or clouds as we experience them every day. It's, it's much, much less amount of particles. So even though on the pictures it shows up as something looking like a cloud, in the end, it's uh, not as dense as that we would imagine. So continuing this view of rather elusive, uh, very diffuse medium in our Milky Way, let's take a look at our whole sky, as if you were see it, uh, if we could see on the north and in the south, uh, if uh, if we would be able to do that. And that's what the one of the satellites uh, from the European uh, Space Agency, Gaia, did. It scanned the sky to create the map of our whole Milky Way, of everything we can see from Earth. And this is what it looks like in 
um, in the visual light, so in the visible light, so the same one as we are looking at every day with our own eyes. And majority of what we are seeing is starlight. Now, stars are, this, are all over the place, everywhere on the sky, uh, and they are especially congregated around, along the disk of the Milky Way. This is not the only thing which we are seeing here. We are also see those dark patches of clouds, which are which we call dust lanes, which are exactly where uh, the manifestation of the interstellar medium through those dark dusty patches. But that's just mostly stars again. If we were looked at uh, the same uh, at the same image, so at this, again on the all sky view uh, of our Milky Way, but trace particularly the emission coming from the gas, and we can do that in the radio and microwave, uh, also from the sky, from from uh, from, the, uh, from the space, sorry. Uh, when we can use, for example, in, fact, in this uh, view from the Planck satellite, what you will see that this whole, all of the space is filled with hydrogen, is filled with this cold gas, which forms filaments and clouds, and just filling the whole of that space. And that's exactly what interstellar medium is. And basically, it's also in its name. It's everything, all of the gas, which sits in the space in between the stars in the galaxy. And it's not only our own Milky Way, but also all of the other galaxies, just as we saw on the picture from Webb, which Kelly was showing earlier in a Whirlpool. But also interstellar medium does not have a very strong cutoff that we get to some certain number of light years from the disk and then suddenly it ends. No, there is no strong barrier ever. All of that gas is um, disappearing uh, gradually. However, if we look at the sky in the X-rays uh, and look at the very, very hot gas, it shows what we astronomers call the circumgalactic medium. Now that gas is more of, of the uh, more of the gas which was expelled from the galaxy through very uh, through the eruptions of, uh, of supernovae through strong winds coming from stars, um, or even from some activity in the center of the, our galaxy millions of billions of years ago. So this interstellar medium transitions into the circumgalactic medium, which in turn transitions into intergalactic medium. Gas is everywhere. Hydrogen is everywhere, even in, in between stars and in between galaxies. Again, it's not very dense and we cannot see it very easily, but it's there. So let's go back inside our own Milky Way and use it as a model for how a typical galaxy uh, looks like and how a typical interstellar medium looks like and what's happening in there. Why is it important? Why are we talking about it today and how we can study it? And I think the most important uh, aspect of, of the gas in between, gal in between the stars is the fact that stars themselves are being born in those dense gas clouds. So you need to have this material in order for new stars being formed. And for the galaxy to keep evolving and to keep living, it has to keep forming new stars. The, and that's basically how, um, how the cycle of, uh, of life in a galaxy goes. We need the gas and we need the gas for the new stars to be born, for the galaxy to be kept alive. Uh, and while the material is being used by the stars when they're being formed, after um, they live a very long life, they produce a lot of material in their interiors, the new part, new elements. In the end of their life, they expel all of that material back into the interstellar medium in a, some sort of a cosmic recycling or baryon cycle, how we call it. But this is not this exactly the same material because some of it was used by those stars in the process of nucleosynthesis to form new elements. Uh, therefore, the, each of the dying star is in fact enriching uh, the interstellar medium with more and more heavy elements. Now let's talk a little bit about this interstellar matter in a bit more detail. What exactly it is, what kinds of matters we are there, uh, what, I, what actually is being built off, and where we can find it uh, in, when we are looking uh, at the, let's say, images from Hubble Space Telescope. In general, as I started at the beginning, even though this gas is everywhere in the galaxy and the galaxy is vast, the total mass of, of this gas is really, really tiny. If we take all of the stars in the galaxy and put them all together, we have uh, the, what we call the galaxy stellar mass. 
and uh, or if we take all of the gas and dust, it would be maybe five to 10% of this summed mass of all of the stars. Of course, if we add even dark matter to that, we are talking about really small percentages. But even in comparison to stars themselves, the amount of the gas and dust is really small. Uh, majority of this gas is in the form of hydrogen and helium. And for those of you who already are following this kind of talks, you probably realize that hydrogen and helium are astronomers' favorite things, and also universe favorite things. They are everywhere. Everything is made out of hydrogen. Every galaxy, every star, everything is made out of hydrogen. It's because hydrogen and helium were the first things to form after uh, the universe uh, began uh, in a big bang and forming such vast quantities that up to this day, even though the stars are burning the hydrogen in their cores, still the hydrogen is the dominant uh, element in the universe. So it's no surprise that it's also dominant in the gas in between stars within the galaxy. But as I said, there is a small percentage of what astronomers call metals. And again, it's a running joke that astronomers and chemists can never agree on to what a metal is. We are, astronomers like to call everything heavier than helium a metal, which every chemist is going to uh, take their hands and uh, up to the air, because how can you call an oxygen or sulfur the metal? But it's just to look at it very simple. Hydrogen and helium formed very long time ago with the creation of the universe, while um, the rest of the metals are being formed in the nucleosynthesis inside in the cores of the stars. And that's how we are distinguishing those two kinds of elements. And it's nothing to do with the chemical properties, really. So excuse me for using the metals later to name all of the elements, which maybe in the, in the, chemical, uh, in the chemistry we would not call it this way. Uh, so the one thing about this percentage of metals in the in the gas is also varies depending on what galaxy we're looking at. This two percent is more or less for Milky Way, but if we will be looking um, back in time into those very distant galaxies which Webb is currently discovering, we could see that the num the percentage of metals in them is a lot rather smaller. And it's because the stars didn't have enough time to form all, all of the metals in their cores. While um, in those billion, uh, billions of years later, we are here in the Milky Way in current time, it was enough time to build up this a small, still small, but a significant percentage of metals. That's a very important fact, which we astronomers, when we study the evolution of galaxies or the environment of different galaxies, have to remember that the gas we are looking at in those very, very far away objects might differ from the ones which we know from Milky Way. Some of the small galaxies like Magellanic Clouds or other um, dwarf galaxies in our local neighborhood also will have a smaller percentage of those metals because they form less stars uh, as they are less massive and therefore in, the, in that way, even though they had enough time, they didn't have enough stars to build up the, the metal percent. So those metals, also each of them have a, a different, um, different abundance in, in the interstellar medium. And uh, for example, carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen are the very mo most popular after the hydrogen and helium, mostly because it's the very first thing which forms in the stars. The next ones and the heavier elements require more and more uh, extreme temperatures, pressures, uh, and e extreme situations for them to be formed. And from all of those different elements in the, in the interstellar medium, the ones which we find the most, apart from carbon, uh, um, nitrogen, or oxygen, is also magnesium, a silicon, or iron. Those last three are especially found often in the dust grains. Here on the right, I'm showing you the picture of a cosmic dust particle brought to Earth by emission stardust. And was the mission which was trying to, gra ga uh, to gather anything, any of those particles uh, in our solar system and bring it back to Earth so we could actually, under the microscope, take a look at the stardust. And this is how it looks, and you can already see uh, by the scale that it's a teeny tiny thing. This is nothing like a dust which we are used to every day in our homes or, or a grain or any grains uh, in, on the ground which you can find. This is very tiny. In fact, the dust grains can be smaller than bacteria. 
So that already shows you the trick, the, how tricky it is for astronomers to study. We usually we are very used to something which is gigantic, like galaxies, uh, while now we have to study something teeny tiny, which is more for the domain for the biologist. Um, what is also interesting about the dust it, uh, is that apart from those, um, those elements by themselves, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it allows for creation of the molecules. So, for example, those cosmic dust particles often have molecules of water or uh, carbon monoxide or even some co more complex organic molecules forming on their surfaces. So, they are kind of a first surface for those more complex chemistry to be formed which in turn becomes very important in the formation of the planetary systems. All right, so we now know a little bit of what this interstellar medium consists of. So let's see where in the galaxy we actually can find some interesting uh, regions in this whole uh, gaseous uh, medium, which fills a, um, fills a void in between the stars. So I'm going to uh, tell you about three areas of this interstellar medium which is very important in astrophysics, not only because what they are themselves, but also how we can use them to study distant galaxies. And I will start from this uh, beautiful example of uh, a diffusion nebula or the emission nebula, which we astronomers also call H2 region. This is a, usually a nebula of hot gas surrounding young stars. And the Orion Nebula is one of the examples, which means that there are the recently formed young, very bright stars are sitting behind that uh, or within, the, this gaseous, within this gaseous nebula and lighting it up and hitting it with a lot of this radiation. What gas does, or especially the atoms, what they do when they are hit with the radiation is that they get excited. And um, quantum mechanics tells us that each different element will uh, react to the light in a different way in a way that it's going to absorb this energy and then shine in a very specific, very narrow chunk of light, uh, which we call uh, the emission line spectrum. And here on the right, you can see the examples of uh, the, those atomic fingerprints of the different elements. So uh, each of those uh, elements will have a very specific and one and only set of the small chunks of lights, the spectrum. Thanks to that, we can, uh, in a very big distance, just by looking at the light of a region like this, tell what it consists of, how much of different elements actually there is in this gas, which is being lit up by the stars. Uh, and actually, we are using this technique not only to understand the nebula in our Milky Way, but even very, very distant galaxies. So with all of those um, very galaxies very far away, which James Webb is finding all the time, uh, to study it, we do not see anything is just a blob, right? We do not see stars, we do not see gas or dust lanes. This is just a round red blob. But by looking at the spectrum, we can notice the emission lines, which correspond to those chunk of light, which we expect for the element to emit, even if it's being lighted up by young stars. And thanks to that, we can say what kind of elements there are in this very, very, very distant galaxy. Plus, by a little bit of a deduction, we can also say, okay, we, we know that for this kind of light to, to form, we need to have a young stars shining at the gas. So maybe we can deduce somehow how many of those young stars there are in the galaxy and, in term, in, in, and then in turn say how many stars in uh, this galaxy on average is forming every year. That's called star formation rate. And this is what we also can deduce by measurements like that. So even if for the galaxy is very, very far away, we can say a lot just by looking at their light. So that's about those beautiful nebulae uh, or H2 regions, which show a lot of this emission line spectrum. Let's see, uh, and let's look at the more dense and, uh, and more colder clouds called molecular clouds, like this example of the Horsehead Nebula here. These are slightly different regions. This is where the gas is actually getting very dense and very cold. And this is the ideal environment for dust. Dust is very, very delicate. And uh, it's very, very difficult to have dust, uh, to have a dust um, particles in the regions around young stars. It's too hot. And the dust evaporates. The water, the particles, everything is going to be destroyed. 
So the dust is only found in the regions which are very dense and very cold, so that the cocoons of gas can actually shield the dust from the radiation of those stars. And usually, because of the solar shielding and its density, those, um, those nebulas appear dark, because no light can penetrate and can go through. So in that way, we know that uh, inside the dust is, is comfortably sitting and can get forming bigger and bigger things. In fact, those very dense gaseous nebula are cosmic nurseries because the denser the material gets and this, this very cold molecular clouds, uh, at some point due to gravitational collapse, it can start forming a protostar. And that's uh, what one of the Discarina like, nebula is one of those places. So even though we can see a lot of young formed stars, I can guarantee you that in those very, very dense, very dark clumps of, cl of gas, which we are seeing here, some new stars are being formed. It is very interesting when we are thinking about that because those, uh, those uh, molecular clouds are often, especially in the visual light, found as a places where there is no light and there are no stars. And for example, as we can see on, on those images, when you can see them against the very dense and stellar, uh, and stellar background, they are just look like the holes in the sky. But in, that, in fact, they are so dense uh, molecular clouds that any light of the, of the star can penetrate them. Uh, and that, that's why inside there is a very good place for stars to form in peace. So if you look even deeper, and this is, these are the uh, images from Hubble Space Telescope of, uh, of, um, the, of the nebula in Orion inside of the very dense clouds of it, you can see a, a very, very small, very small globally, even smaller and dense in pockets of gas where, where the actual stars are being formed. This, each of those um, each of those images shows a small pocket of gas in which the star with its unique planetary system is being formed. Because before the star sh lights up its, in, its internal engine and starts pumping radiation at crazy rates, it's still rather small and rather uh, cool, which, uh, and still gets the material to form and get more massive from the surrounding cloud. And that's also an ex excellent moment for the planets to start forming. And here comes the dust again. Because while we were talking that the interstellar medium is full of hydrogen and helium, uh, the, the dust is mostly of all of those small metals. And on Earth, Earth is not built from hydrogen. Earth is built from all of those other elements or heavier elements. So planets really need dust particles to start up this collection of, of material, which in the end can form uh, the, the, solid, um, uh, the solid surfaces of it. So therefore, it shows that even though it's very tiny, uh, the dust plays a very important role in the formation of, uh, of the planetary system. So there is also the last uh, uh, aspect of, of kind of nebulae or kind of uh, areas in the interstellar medium, which I would like to touch. And this is about the stars which are dying. So after millions of years of cr creating um, the, the elements and heavier and heavier elements in their cores, Eventually, they run out of hydrogen to, to fuel the reaction and stars pass away or fade away. And that's where they return the material which they were formed from, plus these new elements which they formed, they return into interstellar medium. It's a, a baryon cycle of, of the interstellar medium. Smaller stars, and by that we call the ones which are uh, of a mass less than eight solar masses, so our sun is included in this group, uh, when they reach this moment in their lives, um, in the center, they start to form the white dwarf, and all of the rest of the, of the star starts to lose connection to this very teeny tiny core, which, was, which is now so small that it just does not connect anymore with all of the rest. The star starts to pulsate, and uh, it uh, sends out um, the pulses of gas, and the outermost layers usually got dispersed into the space. This is one of the images from James Webb telescopes showing exactly the process. You can see a nebula with those very uh, distinct, distinct uh, circles of waves, which was each pulsation, the star was losing another uh, layer, another of its outer layers. So um, those stellar pulsa pulsations help uh, to, to, get, to remove the layers of the, of the gas uh, from the star. 
And in the end, what it form, was being formed is what we are showing here, which is the planetary nebula. So all of the material which star was made of is now dispersing into the interstellar medium. Plus, of course, the metals which were formed in the center. However, because of the this process can be a little lengthy, like you can see the pulsations are, it's taken still millions of years, it becomes a very good environment for the dust to form. Again, dust needs to be in a cold, dark place. And though those waves uh, of, um, of gas being expelled from the star actually are a very good place for it to start forming. So those kind of stars not only create metals, but also create the actual dust particles. If we look at uh, the larger stars, so the stars which are more than eight solar masses, we have slightly different situation because those guys are going out with a boom. Definitely uh, when, they're, when they reach um, the creation of iron in the cores, there's no way for them more to go. And they expel the outer layers in a very quick and um, catastrophic ejection of material with a very high velocity. What remains are those nebulae, which we know as a um, supernova remains. Uh, and the principle is kind of similar to what we saw before. However, there is an additional, um, additional formation of, of uh, even heavier elements during the explosion. Thanks to this, uh, with this extra energy, we can push more neutrons into the cores of atoms to create even, even heavier elements. So in the supernova explosion, not only we do exactly all of the stuff which the smaller stars that did with the um, returning all of the material and reached, we also create even more elements. And that's as the cycle of life in the interstellar medium. We start from the gas, dense gas clouds, uh, in which they're getting denser and eventually through the gravi gravitational collapse in those very dense molecular clouds, we can form protostars with their protoplanetary systems uh, in, the, in the dense cocoons of gas surrounding them. But then when the star starts to, um, to radiate uh, with the, in the full uh, energy after starting the nuclear uh, synthesis in their center, it can take millions of billions of years for it to keep creating those new materials. And then by the end of, uh, at the end, it returns all of that material with a little extra for the new generations of stars and planets to being formed. Nothing is going to waste in the interstellar medium and all of the, we are all uh, set in this circle of life. So I hope I showed you that even though uh, the interstellar medium or the gas in the interstellar medium as well as dust, even though that they are only a small percentage of a general mass of the galaxy and maybe require a little bit of a hassle to actually see on the images or through our, or through telescopes, it actually does not mean that they are irrelevant because stars and planets form from exactly this material. Uh, and dust play extremely important role in the formation of the especially planetary systems. Uh, and also in the creation of this advanced chemistry of this, um, proto organic molecules and organic molecules. We still do not understand how we go from a very basic organic chemistry into life on planets but that connection has something to do with the interstellar dust for sure. And now I would like to switch gears a little bit. And now that we understand the importance of the interstellar medium and all of that uh, material, how we actually, we astronomers actually study it. I already hinted that it's a rather elusive um, and diffuse medium and might not be that easy to detect or understand. And uh, one of my last points on the slide is that the dust contribute significantly to our galaxy radiation. Uh, so that's one of the other aspects of how dust is important in our understanding of galaxies. So how do we actually study the interstellar medium? Well, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about physics of what happens when there is a stellar light hitting the interstellar cloud of gas and dust. And there are several things which can happen and each of them tells us something different about uh, the nature of the gas, uh, which is in between us and the star. So one thing which can happen, and it mostly happens to the blue light, is reflection. Um, gas can be, uh, so uh, light can be scattered or, or reflected off to the dust grains. And it's uh, the most, uh, uh, the part of the light which feels it the most is the blue light. So those form the 
kind of a reflection nebulae, which you, for example, could see around uh, the Pleiades, as I showed, or, or this is another example uh, of a very bluish looking um, nebula. What we can say from this reflection is mostly where the dust is located, and also a little bit, a little bit about how big the grains are, about the size and where they are, and how many of them they are, uh, because that will on, on that will depend uh, how much the light, the reflected light, will there be. Uh, I also highlighted the excitation, which I already mentioned earlier, that in the uh, in the sum of the nebulae. Uh, not with the reflection is not enough. The light is strong enough to excite the, uh, the, um, the elements uh, on the uh, on the atoms in the nebula, and they start to shine with their very characteristic, uh, with a very characteristic set of emission lines, and that helps us understand the star formation also in distant galaxies. But let's move to the other aspect uh, on, of of the dust, which is thermal emission. So. One of the things which can happen is that when the, the instead of exciting the elements uh, like the atoms, when we have dust particles, it's not just getting excited, it's getting warmed up. And uh, anything which has a temperature higher than zero Kelvin, so anything which has higher temperature than minus 460 Fahrenheit, actually emits infrared radiation. So we can here see a picture of a dog just a dog, but if we point an uh, infrared camera on it, what we will see is a slightly different image. We immediately see that there are bright spots where the dog is very warm. We know that the dogs use their mouths and their tongues to cool themselves down, and that's where they are very warm. Also, their eyes are very warm, but their nose, and if anybody who has a dog can say that, is rather cold. And this, what you can see, with pointing the infrared camera at the dog, is going to be the different parts of the dog, depending on how warm they are, will be brighter or darker with infrared radiation. Infrared can also help us see invisible things. So on the picture on the top, you can see a picture taken in the zoo at night. Where, and again, in, with our, just in a visual light, we're gonna see nothing. But if we point infrared camera, we can see a bird. So you can see that uh, even though for our own eyes, we actually do not see anything, the infrared can already tell us something about the object being there. It's enough for the object to have a temperature to actually radiate and uh, to radiate in the infrared. And dust is exactly the same. The interstellar dust uh, has the same principle. So uh, we can tell about the temperature of the medium, and we can also look and the, and the study the actual properties of the dust by looking at its radiation in the infrared. And James Webb Telescope actually helps us immensely with this task. On the very left of this picture, you can see what I call warm uh, part of the pillars of creation seen by Hubble with the visible light. So more of our own usual human eyes kind of looking. But if we go into more and more infrared, we are going to look into more colder and colder things. So first, what we're going to see is that we are going to look through this uh, this nebula, which was um, which is on the on the background on the picture on Hubble. Suddenly, there's plenty of stars. They were hidden behind that light. But with infrared, we can look through and can see how many stars are being actually formed in the pillars. But if we go even colder, the the image starts to blur up again. But now uh, this is not the gas emitting. This is dust. So all of the glow. All we can see on the mid infrared is actually very is a radiation of the dust itself, and with that we can actually study uh, the properties of the dust. We can link the uh, the amount of radiation we see with amount of dust, with its temperature, with and also with its structure. What kind of elements are there? How is it built? All of those uh, answers we can now get thanks to the James Webb Telescope as well. There's one other very interesting aspect of uh, what happens when the light hits the cloud of um, hit the cloud of the interstellar gas, and it's called extinction. Extinction is when uh, not all of the light is going. So some of the light which was not uh, absorbed to and then re-emitted, some of the light which was not reflected, some goes through, but it goes through red and dim. So what we can do is we can look at uh, the stars in our Milky Way, 
and say, I can expect how this particular star should be. Uh, uh, but what I'm seeing is that it's redder and it's dimmer than what I expected. And then so that I can, uh, I can deduce how much dust is there in between me and the star to cause this effect. It sounds a little elusive, but something, the extinction we could see very well when during the Canadian forest fires, when the cloud of, uh, cloud of uh, fire smoke came and covered uh, our skies. And like on this picture from the New York, we can see this orangey sky. The same happened with the, uh, with the wildfires in California in this orangey dim light but probably even uh if you if you live on the east coast uh you could notice that the something was not right with the air on those days and this is exactly what extinction is doing the light from the sun didn't change what changed is that the air became polluted with all of those particles of smoke and uh what uh, ended up that the, not only the light was orange so it got more red changed the, the color but also uh it was much dimmer and that's exactly what extinction does. So in theory, we could take the pictures from, uh, from the days of Canadian wildfires and uh, make a map of the dust or the smoke in the sky. And that's exactly what we are doing uh, when we are studying uh, stars and their light in the Milky Way. So here is actually, this is not the picture. This is the map of the dust, the dust distribution based on the measurement of extinction. So using all of the stars, which are laying uh, all over the sky, we compare them to what we expect them to look like, and then uh, we create this map, uh, this map of dust. So this is uh, this is exactly what we astronomers have to do every day to to understand uh, what actually is sitting there in this um, diffuse interstellar medium. And for the very last bit, I would like to say about an absorption. And this is something which is uh, the closest to me because this is how I study the interstellar medium. So what is absorption? Well, it's something a little opposite to when we were talking about exciting atoms and emitting the particular chunks of light. And, uh, atoms not only excite, but they can also absorb. That means that when you have a star behind the interstellar cloud, um, the same chunks uh, which would be emitted by the nebula of light can be absorbed, so can be eaten away from the light of the star. And when we look at the star, and then we can see in its spectrum those eating away bits, we can do exactly the same what we did with the bits which are uh, which we are emitted. We can say, aha, uh -huh, there is a fingerprint of a particular element right there. And each element has a very specific set of lines, which makes it uh, very distinguishable. So that's what I do. I look at the stars and Milky Way and in other galaxies, and I look at the spectrum of them and try to identify the elements. And from that, I can also deduce who, how much of different elements are actually in the dust form and how much are in the gas in those interstellar clouds. So uh, I hope that I showed you uh, all of the different ways that we astronomers have to come up with to, uh, to understand and the interstellar medium. It's still elusive, it's very diffuse, and it's not right there to the picking. We have to sometimes come and think of many weird and uh, clever ways how to uh, measure something, and then from that measurement deduce something which we actually are interested in. Uh, those measurements can be very tricky, and we are using everything which we can from ground-based to space telescopes to try to understand the nature of this very elusive, but that, that very important interstellar medium. And with that, I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you so much for listening. Great, thank you so much, Alexandra. That was a really great talk. And I can say, uh, as an astronomer, um, so I think there are two types of astronomers, one type of astronomer who gets really excited about dust and one type of astronomer that gets annoyed that dust is in their way. And I was always the second type I had to correct for the dust when doing my observations. Uh, so I think as the host, I get the prerogative to ask the first question. Um, so I guess I'll start with something you mentioned at the very end. Uh, so for your research, what you're doing is you are looking at um, spectra and you're trying to figure out what sort of elements are in the interstellar medium. Um, so what, what elements are you looking for? 
So mostly I am looking for um, iron, magnesium, um, and uh, other, uh, and sulfur, let's say. These are the easiest ones to, to detect. Um, and also, especially magnesium, uh, iron, or, or um, silicon are the ones which create, which are the main components of dust. So we are mostly looking at those and would like to know uh, how many how how many of the total amount of those uh, those elements in the particular gas cloud actually is in gas and how much it sits and forms the dust? So those are my favorites. Let's say iron. <laughs> it's definitely my favorite. <laughs> oh, awesome! I'm glad you have a favorite element. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, and a, another question for you. Um, so you're talking about using the Milky Way as sort of a, a model to understand other galaxies. So how different is the interstellar medium um, between different galaxies? How is it the how does the Milky Way compare to other galaxies? Maybe like the ones we're seeing with Webb. Oh, definitely. And uh, if we compare um, the Milky Way to some spiral galaxies in our neighborhood. That's basically looking at very similar, um, very similar, especially in terms of interstellar medium. If you're looking at the galaxies uh, which Webb sees in those uh, deep fields, which are those very, very old objects, then we are talking about a completely different environment uh, where uh, stars haven't formed as many metals yet. And actually, we don't exactly know how this interstellar medium looks <laughs> uh, and that far away and cannot, and don't know how similar or different it is to Milky Way. On the other hand, when we have those small dwarf galaxies like Magellanic clouds, mm -hmm. uh, those also will be slightly different. Uh, they often um, they do not have the structure of spirals and, and a nice disk. They offer so more puffy, or or the, they have gigantic star formation regions like Tarantula Nebula. But they have those very very different dynamics within them. And then also we have those, which some could call dead galaxies, where there's no dust, no gas, no stars are being formed, and their interstellar medium uh, is some remnants which can, uh, which are not enough to form new stars. So there's a quite a diversity there. Cool, great. So Grant, are there any questions from the chat? Hello, yes, absolutely. We've had a very active chat today. It's been great. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to get started with this one with the caveat that this may be more of an engineering question, but you deal with the data enough. Um, do you know what the range is that can be measured? So what, is, what you generally look for when you're looking for uh, dust, gas, whatever it is that you're doing, what is the general range in um, the spectrum that you're searching? Oh, I see. Well, that's really depends what you would like to look at, because as I mentioned, if we let's say if we would like to see um, the signature of those different elements, uh, depending on the elements, they will come at the different regions of the spectra. So, for example, I am studying only nearby objects uh, where so where this um, where the light is coming into ultraviolet. That's why I'm studying it with a Hubble Space Telescope. That's the only telescope who can actually reach that. So we are looking at the ultraviolet, and that's where all of those metals sit. Um, when we are looking at, let's say, emission lines uh, f from those um, uh, emission nebula, which I was saying, and then uh, we are looking for those elements to say, oh, where is the hydrogen, where is, uh, where is um, hydrogen, etc. cetera. Uh, then we are looking into, no nominally, we are looking into the visual band, so, the, uh, so this more familiar to us, unless we are going very, very far in time when the redshifting of the light comes into play and everything which is nominally in this uh, visual band goes far into the infrared and then we have to use web. So um, in truth, to have a whole view of, um, of the interstellar medium across different times and across different distances, we have to go basically from ultraviolet to the far uh, infrared and some of the hydrogen shines very strongly in, the, in radio. So to be honest, you can go in any <laughs> aspect uh, and you will find some emission or, or some signature of the interstellar medium. Awesome. Thank you. Um, which kind of leads us into the next <laughs> question, which is I know that we have multiple observatories and multiple uh, stations that we use, but how many light years away would you say you can measure within your error margins? Okay. So what I am doing right now, let's say, 
So using this absorption line method, it's very nearby. Uh, we are going into uh, maybe uh, up to um, Andromeda galaxy, let's say that. And I have to say, as an astronomer, I do not have idea how many light years it is <laughs> from us. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, for the other to in the other talks, it was definitely everything we operate in parsecs and megaparsecs, which is very weird uh, <laughs> unit, which I don't never like to explain. But let's say uh, Andromeda galaxy absorption lines with the emission, because those line those lines are so so strong, we can go very far away, and Webb showed that that we can go. 13 billion years, um, billion light years, right? So it's it's far, far away. Um, so that all depends on the on the on, on the kind of the measurements we are doing. With radio, we also can only go um, not that far. Let's say to the Whirlpool galaxy, right? So uh, it really depends which uh, which uh, which wavelength, which which light we are observing, and which which uh, which characteristic we're looking for. Yeah, so Thank I just you. looked it up just to, to okay. help you out. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the Andromeda Galaxy is 2.5 million light years away. So oh. in astronomy, that is very close by. <laughs> that is pretty close by, yes. <laughs> and uh, I feel very bad now not knowing how many light years that is. Okay. I had to Google it. It's fine. You're uh, fine. Uh, trust me, if there's one thing that the audience is good at, it's asking the questions that you didn't think you needed to know for the talk. <laughs> As I said, we operate on parsecs and megaparsecs, and I really hate introducing that to the general public because it's so <laughs> such a weird <laughs> unit that uh, even I don't really remember the full uh, definition. <laughs> it's all good. Um, all right, so. <clears throat> how significant is dust in the extragalactic medium, and how does it impact on our images or our science looking at very distant objects? How often is it an obstruction? million dollar question <laughs> actually um i would say that there are two camps in the astrophysics right now one saying that there's hardly any dust out there and one's just saying there's plenty of it and up to today we really do not know uh the problem is that for uh, that what i was trying to say during my talk is that dust is a very delicate creature it really needs specific environment to thrive and the moment it's uh accelerated too much or it's warmed up too much it's being destroyed so in the way we're thinking that for the gas to uh, so the, for the dust has to be first formed somewhere and then trans then shoot away from the galaxy. That's why we think that it's actually not that much of it in the interstellar in the intergalactic medium, unless for some reason there are clouds of uh, very dense clouds of material in which this dust could be formed. But this is rather uh, we haven't found anything like that. So this is still a very open question: how much of the dust there is. But in terms of abstraction, the main source of abstraction for our observation from the dust is from our own Milky Way. Because as I showed you those pictures, there's all of the, the interstellar medium is all over the sky we can reach from the Earth. And then our own Milky Way, which is full of dust and full of gas, can, can uh, actually cause us extinction and all of the other um, effects, which actually affect our observations, and we have to account for them. And that's why uh, scientists like me <laughs> have to study this stuff so that all the other scientists can know how much <laughs> they have to <laughs> correct their own measurements, uh, which actually is a more of a problem that I think we fought before Web. So that leads lovely into the next question, which is, what is the most significant way that JWST has impacted your work? So for uh, definitely there are aspects of uh, the, the the parameters of the of the properties of the dust, which were very very difficult to understand from from Earth without in a space infrared telescope, uh, for example, uh, studies of the um, uh, organic molecules. So there, I was mentioning the dust is a great place for those very complex chemistry to start forming, and there is a particular kind of those particles which are called pHs polycyclic hy uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, <laughs> if I'm correct. They are very complex, uh, very complex sheets of, of actually carbon, um, which we do not know much about, but we kind of see them out there in their signatures, in their light signatures, and Webb can perfectly study them and tell us how many hmm. of they are, where they are, 
and maybe how they connect to you know more complex uh, organic um, chemistry which we see on Earth or hopefully on some other planets in the future. Uh, but that's the James Webb definitely comes in here. And MIRI, uh, so the mid infrared, is especially, especially uh, wonderful. This is probably one of the first times we have such a uh, such a wonderful mid infrared instrument because it shows you exactly where the dust shines. So you can point it anywhere and then just lit up the whole dust, which in other ways is very hard to, to trace. Okay, hmm. Grant, I think we are running short on time, so maybe sure. one or two last questions. All right, deal. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll end on this one then. Um, what is the most unexpected discovery while you have made, uh, you have made while studying the galactic medium? Well, this is a wonderful question. Um, so one of the unexpected things which I found is actually very, very recent <laughs> and, uh, hopefully it's going to be published soon. Uh, which, uh, you well, know, astronomers the, love this. We get the pre-published tea. Ooh, I feel ball. honored. <laughs> Um, I was very interested, especially in studying um, the formation of dust in low metallicity environments, so in, so in the, those dwarf galaxies I, I mention all the time, uh, in which they didn't have enough stars to form enough metals in their, in their, um, in their interstellar medium. So uh, what we see when we study their stars is like, oh, it looks like they have only like 5% of the metals that Milky Way has. And we were thinking, how does star dust form in in, an, in in such environment when there's so little metals? And we thought, oh, probably there's hardly any dust. Uh, no, <laughs> actually, it seems like the, the, uh, there is um, nothing stopping. Uh, I mean, apart from the fact that there's less of the dust because there's less of the material, but there's no some dramatic change. That suddenly, uh, dust is not forming in dwarf galaxies. It's still there. And I think this is my most unexpected thing. I thought it's going at some point we're just going to be like there is no more dust. We are reaching the critical amount, but it seems like even in five percent solar, we are still forming dust. That's cool. really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, folks, I think we are going to have to end it here uh, for today. Thank you again, Alexander, for that lovely talk and telling us all about the gas and dust between stars and the, the how that interacts with the life cycle of stars. Uh, thank you to everyone in the chat for the lovely questions. And I will see, well, I won't be here, but Frank will see you all next month uh, for another talk in our public lecture series. Okay, thank you, everyone.